Transurfing in 78 Days. If you don't control reality, reality will control you. Introduction. Message to the Master. Once, in the distant past, or perhaps it was the future, it is difficult to say for certain, the universe forgot itself. Nobody knows why. It is simply the nature of universes that from time to time, they forget themselves. She probably dozed off and could not remember her dream when she woke up. What existed before her dream? The dream before that, perhaps. Maybe the universe was the dream. One way or another, the dream that could not remember itself was transformed into nothing. Could it have been otherwise? Who am I? Nothing asked itself. You are a mirror. 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 Reflection responded in a gazillion flecks of light. Who are you? Mirror asked. I am the reflection in you. Where did you come from? I was born of your question. But I cannot see you. I can't even see myself. How can I be a mirror? I am nothing. Exactly, Reflection answered. Emptiness is, in essence, the most primordial and infinitely multidimensional mirror of all, because in the void, nothing reflects nothing. What do I look like? You don't look like anything. Am I big or small? Yes. What do you mean, yes? You are both. You are as you imagine yourself to be. You are both infinitely big and infinitely small at the same time because infinity and a dot are the same thing. How strange. So, where am I? Right now, you are in the variant space, Reflection answered. Variance of what? Anything at all. The space also appeared as a result of your question. Everything you think about comes into being for you are an infinitely multidimensional mirror. To your every question, there exists an infinite number of answers. Why do I exist? To be. What can I do? Anything. The world was created in the dialogue between the mirror, which we call God, and reflection. Welcome, dear master. I am writing you this message because you are reading these lines, which means you intend to become the ruler of your own world and destiny. In ancient times, everyone was a master inasmuch as they knew that there are two sides to reality, one physical, the other metaphysical. The masters saw and understood the nature of the mirror world. They knew how to create their own reality with the power of thought. Things did not stay that way for long though. With time, the master's intention became locked in material reality. They stopped being able to see and unlearn their power. Nonetheless, their knowledge was not lost. From the depths of time, it survived over millennia to the present day. The sorcerers of antiquity, the knowledge carriers, were able to control reality by the power of thought because reality is primarily created as a reflection of consciousness in the mirror of the world. Those whose consciousness is limited to a material worldview have to make do with worshiping contrived gods and turning to the services of astrologers and fortune tellers. If you don't want to settle for a surrogate future at which a fortune teller claims they can take a sneak peek, if you intend to master your destiny according to your own will, you will certainly succeed. Transurfing, universal knowledge of how to shape reality, is designed to help you. There is no magic to transurfing. Magic as such does not exist. It is really just knowledge of the principles of the mirror world. The knowledge itself is fairly self-explanatory. In fact, it is so simple and commonplace that it could not count as magic by any stretch of the imagination. And still, Aladdin's lamp looked like it was just a bit of old tin and the Holy Grail was not made of gold. Everything truly great is unfathomably simple and has no need to show off or hide. In contrast, things that are superficial and of no real worth tend to be masked under a veil of magnificence and mystery. When magic is stripped of its fairy tale attributes and embedded in daily life, it ceases to belong to the realm of the mystical and the unexplained. It loses its fascinating mystique because it is bang in the middle of everyday life. The beauty of the transformation is that everyday life no longer seems dull and ordinary. It transforms into a new reality that can be shaped as long as you follow certain rules. This book outlines the set of basic principles essential to creating your own reality. The transurfing principle falls into two basic categories relating to thoughts and actions. 
When these categories reflect in the dual mirror of our world, they give rise to their opposites. So on either side of the dual mirror, there are reason, or logic, and soul, or heart, action, or inner intention, and passivity, or outer intention. The motivation, thoughts, and actions of the subjects being reflected have to be in balance with these four elements. Reason and action relate to the physical world, soul and passivity relate to the metaphysical world, which is a reality no less objective than its material counterpart. If you only take one facet of the dual world into account, you will never succeed in shaping your own reality. This is why materialists busy themselves overcoming obstacles which they have basically created themselves, and idealists float about in a world of clouds and dreams. Neither can successfully shape their reality but you can learn how to. Even if you are unfamiliar with the principles of transurfing, you can complete this practical course in creating your own reality within 78 days. Each morning, read one principle and its interpretation and try to implement it throughout the rest of the day. The next day, move on to the next principle, remembering to practice the principles you have covered previously. Continue in this way until you have assimilated all the principles consecutively. Of course, this is a relatively extended process, but it is the most effective way of assimilating the principles. Creating your own reality mostly comes down to practice. In applying the principles, listen to your intuition and trust your intuition. Good luck. Reality is an unfamiliar guise. Since time immemorial, people have understood that the world behaves in a dual manner. On the one hand, everything that happens on the material level is more or less clear and can be explained from the point of view of the laws of natural science. On the other hand, when we encounter phenomena originating in the subtle planes, these laws are no longer applicable. Why has not it ever been possible to unite different manifestations of reality into a single knowledge system? Strangely, it is as if the world were playing hide and seek with us, not wanting to reveal its true essence. As soon as scientists discovered a new law to explain one phenomena, another appears to contradict it. This pursuit of truth is as elusive as a shadow and will go on forever. The interesting thing is that the world does not just hide its true face, it willingly takes on whatever guise we attribute to it. This is clearly evident in all branches of science. For example, if you imagine that a microcosm consists of particles, then there will be no shortage of experiments to support this supposition. If you assume that the microcosm is not a particle, but an electromagnetic wave, the world won't object, and will readily manifest itself accordingly. You could ask the world whether it consisted of solid matter with just the same success. It would answer, yes. Or maybe it consists of energy. Again, it will answer in the affirmative. As we know, microparticles in a vacuum are constantly being created and annihilated as energy is transformed into matter, and vice versa. It would be futile to ask the world what came first, matter or consciousness. It would change its mask just as cunningly, revealing to us whatever side of the world we wish to see. Representatives of various teachings argue with each other, each trying to prove an opposing point of view, but reality will always pass a dispassionate verdict because, in essence, they are all right. The world agrees with us and dodges us at the same time. In other words, it acts like a mirror. It literally reflects all of our notions of reality, whatever they happen to be. So where does that leave us? If the world always agrees with what we think about it, at the same time constantly evading a direct answer, are not all our attempts to explain the nature of reality in vain? The fact is, everything is much simpler than that. There is no point in searching for an absolute truth in individual manifestations of a multifaceted reality. We just have to accept the fact that reality as a mirror has two aspects. A physical aspect, which you can touch, and a metaphysical aspect, which lies beyond the limits of perception, and yet is no less objective in nature. At the present time, science deals with the side of life that is reflected in the mirror, whereas esotericism tries to look at life outside the mirror. The entire debate basically boils down to a difference in focus. So what exactly does lie on the other side of the mirror? Transurfing, like any esoteric teaching, offers one of many possible answers to this question. On the other side of the mirror glass, there lies the variant space, an information structure that stores the scripts to all possible events. The number of variants is infinite. 
as infinite as the number of possible positions of a single dot on a grid. The variant space is a record of everything that ever was and everything that ever will be. This also means that access to the variant space provides the opportunity for clairvoyance. The only setback is that because the number of variants is infinite, one can see events that will not be realized in physical reality. This is why clairvoyants often make quote unquote mistakes in their forecasts. In the variant space, you can see things that have never happened, as well as things that will never actually happen. In this sense, you may rest assured, no one can truly know your future because no one can determine which potential version of it will ultimately be played out on the material plane. Similarly, there is no guarantee that what you see in a dream is the actual sector of the variant space that will be embodied in reality. This is wonderful news. If the future is not predetermined, there is always reason to hope for the best possible outcome. The task of transurfing is not to look regretfully at the past or even to peer apprehensively into a tomorrow which is yet to come, but to shape intentionally your own reality. It might seem difficult to believe. Just where is the, just where is the variant space? How can this be possible? From the point of view of our three-dimensional perception of the world, the variant space is everywhere and at the same time, nowhere. It could lie beyond the visible universe or it could be in your coffee cup. One thing is certain. It is not in the third dimension. Paradoxically, we visit the variant space every night. Our dreams are not illusions in the usual sense of the word. People lightheartedly attribute their dreams to the realm of fantasy, not suspecting that they reflect real events which might have occurred in the past or might still occur in the future. We know that people sometimes see images and dreams that do not seem to originate in this world. Or at least, it is quite clear that the dreamer can't have seen their dream content in real life. If a dream is our brain's way of imitating reality, where do all these extraordinary pictures and narratives come from? If we roughly attribute all conscious aspects of the human psyche to the mind and all its subconscious aspects to the soul, then we could say that a dream is the soul's flight through the variant space. The mind does not imagine dreams, it actually sees them. The soul has direct access to the information field where all scripts and set designs are permanently stored like frames on a film strip. The phenomenon of time only manifests when the film strip is moving. The mind acts as an observer and ideas generator. Memory is also directly related to the variant space. It has already been proved that the brain is not physically capable of storing all the information a person accumulates during their lifetime. So how does the brain remember things? The brain does not store the information itself. It stores something akin to an address to where the data is held in the variant space. The reason people don't remember their past lives is that when the physical body dies, those addresses are lost. Under certain conditions, however, the address files can be restored. The mind is not capable of creating anything fundamentally new. It simply constructs a new version of a house from old building blocks. The material for any scientific discovery or masterpiece of art comes from the variant space and is received by the mind through the heart. Clairvoyance and intuitive knowledge come from the same place. A discovery in science, Einstein wrote, is not accomplished in any logical way. It only takes on logical form afterwards in the course of exposition. A discovery, even the very smallest, is always an insight. The solution comes from outside, as unexpectedly as if someone had whispered it in your ear. The concept of the variant space should not be confused with the well-known concept of a common information field through which data can be transferred from one object to another. The variant space is a stationary matrix, a structure that determines everything that can potentially take place in our world. When we accept the simultaneous existence of two aspects of reality, the physical and the metaphysical, then our picture of the world becomes much clearer. When these two aspects of reality come into contact on the surface of the mirror, phenomena arise that are usually attributed either to the paranormal or unexplained mysteries. Corpuscular wave dualism, in which a microscopic object is perceived as either a wave or a particle, is a vivid example of these two realities coming into contact with one another. However, human beings are the most incredible example of this phenomenon. Living creatures who simultaneously combine the material and the spiritual. In a sense, 
We are living on the surface of a giant dual mirror, on one side of which lies our material universe, and on the other stretches the black infinity of the variant space. Finding ourselves in this unique position, it would be at the very least short-sighted to living within the confines of the conventional worldview, making use of just one aspect of reality, the physical aspect. Given the right conditions, human thought energy is capable of materializing any sector of the variant space. In the state of being referred to in the context of transurfing as the unity of heart and mind, an unfathomable magical power is born. The power of outer intention. Everything that is customarily attributed to magic is connected to outer intention. This is the power the ancient mages used to erect the Egyptian pyramids and create other miracles. Intention is referred to as outer because it exists external to the individual human being and as a result lies beyond the mind's control. That said, people are capable of gaining access to it in certain states of consciousness. Anyone who subordinates their will to this powerful force becomes capable of incredible things. However, in the contemporary world, most people have long lost the skills honed by the inhabitants of ancient civilizations like Atlantis. Fragments of ancient knowledge have been preserved to the present day in the form of scattered esoteric teachings and practices, but it is quite difficult to apply this kind of knowledge in everyday life. Despite the intricacy of its practical realization, the secret to mastering outer intention is fairly simple. The answer to the enigma lies in the phenomenon known as lucid dreaming. In an ordinary dreaming state, events develop independently of the mind's will. Until the dreamer becomes conscious of the fact that they are dreaming, they are not able to control what happens. The dreamer is totally under the power of non-lucid dreaming in which the dream just happens to them. The moment the dreamer becomes conscious of the fact that it is all just a dream, they discover they have amazing abilities. The impossible is possible in a lucid dream. You can control events in the dream by the power of intention and do incredible things, like fly. The ability to control one's dream is acquired the moment a person becomes conscious of themselves in the dream world comparative to the physical reality. At this stage of awareness, the dreamer has their physical reality as a reference point to which they can return the moment they wake up. Physical reality, in turn, is like a non-lucid dream in waking. The dreamer is under the power of circumstance and life just happens. They don't remember their past lives and so they have no reference point relative to which they could rise to the next level of awareness. Yet, not all is lost. There is an alternative method in transurfing which you can use to get outer intention to work. People are capable of creating their own reality, but this means following certain rules. The ordinary human mind tries to influence the reflection in the mirror, but is unsuccessful. It is the image itself that has to be changed, and the image is created by the focus and nature of the person's thoughts. Desire alone is not enough to bring what you want into reality. The image or thought form on one side of the mirror has to coincide with certain parameters of the corresponding sector of the variant space, located on the other side of the mirror. But that is not all you have to know how to communicate with the mirror, which, it has to be said, is most strange and complex. Imagine this unusual scenario. You are standing in front of a mirror, but there is nothing in the reflection, just emptiness. The image gradually begins to appear, but only after some time, as in a photograph that is being developed. At some point, you begin to smile, but the mirror still reflects the former serious expression on your face. This is exactly how the mirror of the variant space works. Only the delay factor is incomparably greater and therefore the changes that take place cannot be clearly perceived. Material realization is inert, but if you fulfill certain conditions, a new reflection will appear, which means that a dream can become a reality. Your thought form acts like an existing physical object that is standing in front of a mirror. Your reflection, which has no material substance, is imaginary metaphysical, and at the same time, as real as the form itself. Unlike the scenario with an ordinary mirror, in transurfing, the material world is the reflection. The images in it, which are served by the intention and thoughts of God, as well as all living beings, are his manifestations. 
The variant space is a kind of matrix, a template for cutting and sewing, as well as a format for the fashion show, the movement of all matter. It stores information about what should happen in the material world and how. Each possible variation of potential reality represents a different sector of the variant space, which contains scripts and set designs for the trajectory and form of moving matter. In other words, the sector determines in each individual case what should happen and what that should look like. Therefore, the mirror divides the world into two halves, the actual and the imaginary. Everything that acquires material form resides in the actual half and unfolds in accordance with the laws of natural science. Science and the ordinary perception of the world deal only with what happens in quote-unquote reality. By reality, it is generally accepted to mean everything that can be observed and directly influenced. When we reject the metaphysical side of reality and only take into account the material world, the activities of all living beings, including man, are reduced to primitive movements within the confines of internal intention. Internal intention helps us achieve our goals by means of directly influencing the world around us. In order to achieve something, we have to take certain steps. We push, shove, elbow our way ahead, and generally carry out a specific type of work. Material reality instantly responds to a direct action which creates the illusion that results can only be achieved by direct influence. However, in the context of the material world, the range of goals that are realistically achievable using this approach is greatly narrowed. Here, we can only rely on what is already available to us. Everything comes down to material resources, which as a rule are never enough and which are severely limited. In this world, everything is imbued with the spirit of rivalry. There are just too many people wanting to achieve the same thing. Of course, within the limits of internal intention, there really is not enough. So where can we find the conditions and circumstances necessary to achieve our goals? The answer is only in the variant space. On the other side of the mirror, everything exists in abundance and there is no competition. None of the products is in stock, but the beauty of it is that you can choose anything at all as if from a catalog and place an order for what you want. Sooner or later, your order will be delivered and you will not even have to pay for it. You just have to fulfill certain straightforward conditions and that's it. Sounds like a fairy tale? Not at all. It is more than realistic. Thought energy never disappears without trace. It is capable of materializing any sector of the variant space whose characteristics correspond to the quality of the thought waves being emitted. It only appears to us as if everything in the world were a result of interaction between material objects. Equally important here is the role played by processes which occur on the subtle planes when virtual variants of potential reality become embodied in physical reality. The casual relationships involved in subtle processes cannot always be perceived and yet together they comprise the better half of reality. The physical embodiment of sectors within the variant space takes place, as a rule, irrespective of individual will since people rarely use thought energy in a purposeful way, to say nothing of less intellectually developed beings. A person who is firmly grounded in the realities of life is like a shopper who wanders along empty shelves in a store stretching up to reach for goods which are already marked sold. There are only poor quality products left, and even those are expensive. Instead of just looking at the catalog and placing an order, they rush about randomly searching for things, waiting in long queues, desperately struggling to squeeze through the crowd, and getting involved in conflicts with the shopkeepers and other customers. As a result, they don't get what they want and end up with more problems than they started with. Meanwhile, this grim reality germinates in that person's consciousness and gradually ends up materializing into reality. All living beings create the layer of their personal world with their actions on the one hand and their thoughts on the other. All these individual layers arrange themselves one on top of the other as every living being contributes to the creation of the wider reality. Each layer is made up of specific Each layer is made up of a each layer is made up of a specific set of conditions and circumstances which produce a person's lifestyle. The individual conditions of each person's life differ. They may be favorable or unfavorable, comfortable or severe, inviting or aggressive. Naturally, the environment in which a person is born bears some significance. 
Yet, how a person's life develops will depend for the most part on that person's relationship to themselves and their environment. A person's attribute to life is largely determined by subsequent changes in lifestyle. The sector, scripts, and set designs that most correspond to the focus and quality of a person's thoughts are those which will ultimately be made manifest in material reality. Two factors play a part in the process of creating an individual layer. Internal intention on the one side of the mirror and outer intention on the other. People can influence objects in the material world through action. With their thoughts, they bring into physical reality things which are not yet there. When a person is convinced that all the best of this world has already sold out, their shelves will remain empty. When they think that buying a high quality item will mean standing in a huge line and then parting with a huge sum of money, then that is exactly what will happen. If a person's expectations are pessimistic and riddled with doubt, then they will undoubtedly be justified. If a person expects to meet with an unfriendly environment, their misgivings will come true. Yet all a person has to do is embrace the innocent thought that the world has saved the best for them. And for some reason, that works as well. That is how people shape the layer of their personal world with the power of thought. For the most part though, people don't understand how it all works. People try to make everything quote unquote exactly how I want it by applying the basic principle of quote unquote, wherever I turn, that's where I'll go. And wherever I put my foot on the gas, that's where I'll make a breakthrough. Yet for some reason, the world does not want to yield to this principle. What is more, when a person turns in one direction, life carries them off in quite another. It makes you think, given that reality behaves in such a strange manner, perhaps we should take a different approach. What if life works in accordance with completely different laws, yet people do not want to stop and look around so they continue to push hard ahead? The result of this kind of creativity is that you end up with a world layer in which nothing is how I want it to be. In fact, quite a lot turns out just as I didn't want it to. How strange, moody, and unaccommodating reality is. One often gets the feeling that the world is doing it out of spite. Trouble seems to be drawn to us by some inexplicable magnetic force. Our fears are realized and our worst expectations justified. We are persistently followed by the very things to which we are adverse, and so try to avoid. Why? The theory of transurfing explains why it often turns out that you get what you didn't want, especially if you desperately didn't want it. Is there something you hate or fear with all of your heart? Outer intention will give it to you in abundance. The energy of thoughts, which are born from the unity of heart and mind, transform potential into reality. In other words, the sector in the variant space that corresponds to the quality of thought waves can be materialized if the feelings of the heart are one with the thoughts of the mind. This is not the only reason our worst expectations are realized. A problem-free life is actually the norm. Everything in life should develop smoothly if you go with the variance flow and do not upset the balance. Nature does not like wasting energy and has no desire to create intrigue. Unfortunately, circumstances and events occur as a result of excess potential which introduces an element of distortion into the energetic environment. Dependent relationships only exacerbate the problem. Excess potential arises when some quality or another is attributed excessive inflated importance. Dependent relationships are created when people begin to compare themselves to compartmentalize and set conditions like, if you do that, then I'll do this. Excess potential is not necessarily a problem as long as the distorted evaluation exists relative only to itself. As soon as the artificially elevated evaluation of one object is placed in comparative relationship to another, polarization crops up which creates a wind of balancing forces. Balancing forces try to neutralize the polarization and in the majority of cases, their impact is focused on the person creating it. These are examples of unconditional potential. I love you. I love myself. I hate you. I don't like you. I don't like myself. I am good. You are bad. These judgments are self-sufficient. They are not based on comparison or contradistinction. Here are some examples of potentials built on dependent relationships. I love you provided that you love me. I love myself because I am better than the rest of you. You are bad because I am better than you. I'm good because you are bad. I do not like myself because I'm worse than anyone else. You repulse me because you are not like me. You repulse me because you are not like me. 
There is a huge difference between the first group and the second. Value judgments, based on comparison, create polarization. Balancing forces try to neutralize the heterogeneity by the collision of opposites. It is exactly the same as when the opposite poles of a magnet attract. This is why trouble creeps into our lives so intrusively as if on purpose. For example, seemingly incompatible individuals unite as a married couple as if they were trying to punish one another. In any team, there will always be that one person you find particularly irritating. Murphy's Law, or what we would call Sod's Law, is the same principle. Polarization distorts the energetic environment and generates vortices of balancing forces, as a result of which, reality is poorly reflected as if in a distorting mirror. People do not seem to understand that the problem has arisen because of something that is upsetting the balance, and so they decide to fight the outside world rather than eliminating the source of polarization. All it really takes is to fulfill the basic rule of transurfing. Give yourself permission to be yourself and allow others to be different. You have to let the world go completely wherever it likes. You have to let the world go completely wherever it likes. Loosen your grip. The more you insist on your own desires and claims, the stronger the magnet that attracts the opposite. This is what happens. Literally, you grab the world by the throat and so it fights back, trying to free itself. There is no point in pushing and demanding. That only exacerbates the situation even more. Instead, the rule of transurfing requires that you consciously change your attitude towards the situation. The fact that Saad's law even exists is a bit odd, don't you think? Why should the world behave in such a bitchy manner? Or does it all come down to speculation and prejudice? There is no getting away from it. The tendency does exist. Fortunately, the transurfing model not only reveals the reason for this pattern, it explains how it can be avoided. The rule of transurfing works flawlessly and anyone who follows this rule will be freed from experiencing the kinds of problems that seem to appear in our lives without any particular reason. All you have to do is loosen your grip. Stop grabbing life by the throat and you will find it instantly becomes friendly and willing. Those who do not let go will carry on like a magnet attracting the opposite. The law of bad luck is not the only thing. The moment that opposites meet, their opposition strives to intensify further. The well-known law of unity and conflict of opposites, whose title is self-explanatory, is now basic textbook knowledge, just like the Volga flows into the Caspian Sea and the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. But it's not quite that simple. Ask yourself, why should this law even exist? The reason for the ubiquitous union of opposites is clear. By making them collide, balancing forces restore equilibrium. So why are opposing elements in a constant state of conflict? You would think it would be the opposite. They collide, neutralize each other, and calm down. But no, opposites go on provoking each other until they get the opportunity to fight. Unless the bully is dragged away, the fight will go on forever. There's no shortage of examples. You know that life sometimes gets on your nerves a bit. Everyone experiences this in their own way to varying degrees. Basically, the essence is this. If right now there is something that is capable of throwing you off balance, it will appear as if to spite you. This is what happens. If you are anxious, worried, or down about something, your nerves will be tense even just a little. Then as if it were directly connected, a clown appears and starts jumping about and rattling on, winding you up even more. You get even more irritated and the clown jumps about even more frantically. There are many ways of increasing your tension. For example, you are in a hurry and afraid you were going to be late. The clown claps and rubs its hands and cries, let's go. From this moment on, everything starts to go against you. People block your way. They stride along with a decorum, but you still cannot pass them. You rush to get through a door, but there is literally a line forming of the laziest people in the world who are barely placing one foot in front of the other. The cars on the road are doing the same thing. It is as if they have all agreed beforehand to get in your way. Of course, some things can be put down to perception. When you are in a hurry, the rest of the world seems to slow down, but the real telltale signs are when the lift breaks down, the bus is late, and there's a traffic jam. In all this, there is some ill-intentioned objective tendency. I could cite other examples. If you are concerned about something intense, people around you will always do exactly what irritates you, and they seem to know to do it now when you would most like to be left alone. 
The children start misbehaving, although they were fine before. Someone sitting next to you starts slurping and swallowing loudly. Various individuals get under your feet and pressure you with their problems. Interference, unfortunately, creeps in everywhere. If you wait impatiently, you will wait for ages. If there is someone you particularly do not want to see, they will appear, and so on. The more irritated you become, the more external pressure intensifies. The more tense you are, the more people will get to you. The interesting thing is that they are not actually doing it deliberately. It would never occur to them that they might be bothering someone. So why this behavior? There are all sorts of gray areas in the psychology of the subconscious. However strange it may sound, in the majority of cases, people are driven by unconscious motives. What is even more interesting is that the driving force which shapes our unconscious motives originates in the external world, not in the human psyche. This force comes from pendulums. Unseen but very real energy informational entities which are created by thought energy. We talked a lot about pendulums in the first book on transurfing. Pendulums can always be found in places where they can survive on conflict energy. It is not that these beings are capable of plotting anything or realizing a conscious intention. Pendulums are like leeches. They sense polarization and inhomogeneity or lumpiness in the energy field and feed by sucking on it. And that's not the worst of it. What is so horrific is that rather than just absorbing conflict energy, they somehow push people to behave in such a way that they give out even more of the same type of energy. They do everything possible to make sure that the source of energy is spilling over. Pendulums pull at people with invisible threads as if they were puppets and they obey. How precisely pendulums influence people's motives is not yet clear, but they are extremely good at it. Pendulums cannot access clear consciousness, but they don't need to. The subconscious is quite enough. To one degree or another, everyone is partially asleep in waking life. We often do things in a laid-back manner, on autopilot, without being aware of it, without saying to ourselves, in this moment, I am awake and I am aware of what I am doing, why I am doing it, and how. Our level of active awareness is particularly low when we are at home or when we find ourselves in a crowd. In a domestic setting, the need for heightened self-control is relatively minor, and so we are relaxed, almost dropping off. In the external world, within a close circle of friends, our awareness is more alert and working on self-control. In large crowds, a person's actions are spontaneous but also fall into strong correlation with the general urges of the collective. To illustrate how a pendulum works, let's take the simple example of a passerby who you follow and then overtake. Just as you attend a step to the side to walk past, the pedestrian takes a spontaneous step to the side as if deliberately blocking your way. You try and pass them on the other side, but the pedestrian automatically veers in that direction. What causes the passerby to change direction? They can't see you, and why should they care that you want to pass by? Perhaps the pedestrian senses someone approaching from behind and instinctively stops their arrival from passing and getting ahead. This explanation would seem viable, but still, that's not it. In nature, if you think in terms of instinct, rivalry is always expressed in situations where both parties are stood facing each other. What makes the pedestrian veer to one side is the pendulum. People just walk without thinking about where they are placing their feet or how to keep a perfectly straight line. In this sense, people are asleep, and so from time to time, the line of their steps spontaneously deviates to one side or the other. The motivation, the choice to move in one direction or another, originates in the subconscious, which in that moment is not being controlled by the mind, which means it is open to the pendulum. Then you come along and try to overtake the pedestrian in front of you. Essentially, this is a conflict, albeit a very meager one. The pendulum's objective is to increase the energy of the conflict, and so it nudges the pedestrian to take an involuntary step to one side, to block your way, aggravating the situation further. You cannot say that the pendulum is acting deliberately because it is not capable of conscious intention. Balancing forces act just as unconsciously. I should emphasize that we are talking about certain processes of which the precise mechanism is still unclear and not about the rational behavior of unconscious beings. We are simply noting individual tendencies and patterns in the energy informational world. There is no point in analyzing what kind of pendulum is working in this kind of situation, where it comes from, how it manages to do what it does, and what is really happening on an energetic level. We would never get to the bottom of it.
Only one main conclusion concerns us here. When balancing forces make opposites collide, the pendulums do everything to inflame the energy of rising conflict. That is the law of the pendulum. Endless pendulum battles, be they domestic arguments or armed conflicts, all run according to this law. When opposition arises, events will always develop to intensify the conflict and that includes temporarily and feigned attempts at reconciliation. When the pendulum law is at play, common sense has no weight at all. This is why very often common sense seems to have no bearing on the actions of individuals or states. In conflict situations, a person's motives come under the pendulum's power. That is why when you look back on how you behaved in the past, you often find yourself thinking how strange it all was and wondering what on earth happened to your common sense. You ask yourself, what could possibly have possessed me to do such a thing? The answer is that we sometimes come from the subconscious without being fully aware of what we're doing. It is only later, when our consciousness is free of external influence, that events can be evaluated more objectively. People who have been close start to argue and then part ways because they think they are incompatible despite the fact that they have shared many happy times together when everything was wonderful between them. All of a sudden, a person changes and their behavior becomes hostile. They are not like how they used to be, even in relatively recent times. Sounds familiar, right? In reality, it is not a matter of one partner or the other changing. The reason one person behaves in a manner their partner finds totally unacceptable is because the pendulum is forcing them to behave that way. The pendulum controls the subconscious motivations of people who find themselves in a confrontation. The control is designed to increase conflict energy. Generally, people are unaware of what pushes them to go on the offensive. A person might behave totally illogically or abnormally. This effect is quite evident in inexplicably brutal crimes. Later, when they are sitting in the dock, the offender recalls their crime in horror and wondering, what on earth came over me? They are not lying either. Often, the crime is a complete surprise to the perpetrator, who remembers what they did as if it were some terrible nightmare. The sleep is particularly deep when a person's attention falls into a snare. In certain communities, like in the army, a club, or sect, an environment is created which supports a certain type of thinking and behavioral stereotypes. This lulls a person to sleep, which makes their subconscious susceptible to the zombifying influence of the pendulum. Then certain things happen which would seem utterly incomprehensible to any objective observer. Why do people kill others so viciously, simply because they worship different gods? They're not getting in anyone else's way. People suffer deprivation of war and die in dozens, hundreds, thousands, and millions. Where is their preservation instinct? Fighting for the sake of wealth and land is understandable, but how do you explain killing for the sake of one's faith? The idea of peace is close to everybody's heart, and yet the wars continue. The idea of a one God is quite clear. The notions of goodness, justice, equality, one could go on forever, are all the same. Everyone understands, but common sense doesn't seem to work and evil triumphs. Where does the evil come from? The pendulum is the universal source of evil. In a confrontational situation involving anything or anyone, you don't have to observe for long before it becomes obvious that events are moving towards an increase of conflictual energy. If the battle ceases, then it will not be for long, and only so it can flare up again later with renewed strength. Of course, pendulums come in all sorts of guises, but they are all destructive to varying degrees. Some are relatively harmless. The purpose of the trans-surfing pendulum, for example, is to make as many people as possible think about what is really happening. It is not a question of freeing ourselves from pendulums altogether. That would hardly be possible. The main thing is not to let yourself be a puppet, to be aware in your actions, and to use these structures to your own advantage. So, how can we free ourselves from their influence? Waking up and being aware of how a pendulum is trying to manipulate you and understanding what is really happening is already half the battle. The power of the pendulum's influence is inversely proportional to awareness. The pendulum only has power over you whilst you are falling asleep in waking life. Most importantly, do not get involved in destructive pendulum battles unless it serves you personally in some way. If you're in a crowd, you need to come down from the stage of action into the audience hall, look around you, and wake up. Ask yourself, what am I doing here? Am I fully aware of what's happening? Why am I here? The moment of waking up from sleeping in waking life should be absolutely clear. Like the phrase used above, 
in this moment, I am awake and fully conscious of what I am doing, why, and how I am doing it. If you maintain this level of awareness, everything will be all right. If you do not, then in any conflict, even the most minor, you will be the puppet. Things get much more difficult when something is annoying you. In this case, the clown will keep jumping about until your nerves are strained. This usually means that the pendulum has caught your attention in a snare. In order to free yourself from the pendulum, you need to become indifferent, although this can be difficult to do. For example, the neighbor's music is driving you mad. Your task is to unhook yourself from the pendulum at all costs. It is almost impossible to force yourself out of reacting. There is no point in trying to suppress your emotions. Instead, turn your attention to something else. Try listening to your own music. Not too loudly, but just loud enough to drown out the neighbor's music. Think of other ways to distract yourself. If you manage to occupy your thoughts with something else, the neighbors will gradually mellow out. The same principle applies in other situations too. If the clown is dancing, your attention has been caught in some kind of snare. You have been caught up in the pendulum's game whose goal is to increase the energy of conflict. In order to free yourself from the snare, you have to shift your attention. Generally speaking, things are not that bad. Nothing will happen to spite you as long as you aren't sleeping in waking life. You might think that all the above sounds quite ridiculous. It's not easy getting used to the idea that certain entities can control you. Whether you accept this knowledge or not is a matter of personal choice. You don't have to believe it. Simply observe and then draw your own conclusions. That is a brief summary of the concept of transurfing. If, in the process of working with the transurfing principles, you come across something you don't understand, you can always refer to the source material, the book in five volumes, Transurfing Reality.